Good morning, Pioneer. How's everyone doing this morning? That's the part where no one ever really knows exactly. Should they say truly, you know, what it is? There? I hope you're doing well. I'm glad that you're here. I want to say a, a special welcome to those of you that came because uh, I put a card on your door. Uh, I hope that you're able to, to, to be here. If, uh, if, you, if you like what I'm about to say in the next few minutes and you would like to have an extra invitation card for part two, which will be two weeks from now, two Sabbaths from now, we have some extra cards sitting here on the front pew. You're welcome to come and get one and to pass it along uh, to a friend. I also want to let you know that in the last three Sabbaths of October, I'm going to be doing a series called How to Stay Married Forever and Like It. So I hope that you can be here for that. The, the series is truly for a very broad spectrum of people. Those that are looking at some point to get married, you will benefit greatly from coming to that, uh, those three parts. If you are currently married, you will benefit. And if you're not married, but you need advice to tell people who are, you too can be blessed by coming to this. That'll be the last three Sabbaths of October. We're going to have an a invitation card uh, that we'll pass out to you as well. And this is a series... Uh, if you're, if you're a, a year-round part of our campus here, uh, you may be wondering, are there, are there special times in the year when I can invite my, my next-door neighbor, you know, lives off campus, or maybe in another town or whatnot? By all means, this is a great series. This is something that will be accessible for everyone, truly, regardless of whether they have a faith background or not. So I just want to put that on your radar. Last three Sabbaths of October, hope that you will be able to join us at that time. Now, Today, question for you, show of hands, how many of you would like to know God's will for your life? Yes. Okay, those of you that are home, maybe you can't see our congregation fully here, almost every hand went up to the surprise of absolutely no one. We are, after all, sitting in church, having a worship service. One would suspect that this would be a place where there would be people that would want to know what God's will is for their life. However, it is my contention that even outside of these four walls, there are many other people that would also like to know God's will for their lives. You know, I think even if you went to like any major city, in, in the United States, let's say that you went down to Chicago on a, a sunny Sunday afternoon and you asked a random crowd of people at a street corner waiting for the light to change, would you like to know God's will for your life? I'm going to guess that most of their hands would go up, if for no other reason than sheer curiosity. Sure, what would he want for me? Okay. In legislative assemblies in this country, uh, local city councils, uh, 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 even at the U.S. Senate, uh, the House and the Senate, they have prayer prior to many of their sessions. How come? Well, I think there's still a general consensus that uh, if there is a will of God for our country, even if the U.S. citizen isn't necessarily wanting it for their life, they sure would like to have the leaders of the country know so they could do the right thing. And multiply that by a multitude of, boy, the list is long, uh, auto races, uh, football games, uh, civic uh, events of, of all kinds, social protests, social gatherings, weddings, funerals, you name it, we will offer a word of prayer. How come? Because even in our ever secularizing society, there are still large numbers of people that wonder if there is a God, and if there is a God, he probably has a will, and it sure would be nice if there is a God and he has a will, if that will was in our favor. In fact, even the devil himself wants to know God's will. Not so that he can keep it, but so that he can orchestrate effective plans against it. It seems to me to be an indisputable fact there are so very many people that want to know God's will. So why is it then that so many people seem to have such great difficulties, not just in following God's will, but in even finding it out in the first place. Let me put an even finer point on this. I think, and you're going to have a hard time dissuading me from this opinion, I think that one of the greatest needs of the world today is to know God's will and to have the courage and strength to carry it out. Thank you, sister. I, we agree on this. It, it's, it's lonely, isn't it, here? It's just, it's just the two of us, right? 
I'm going to give you one, one other opportunity, okay? So this is your cue. One of the greatest needs of the world today is to know God's will and to have the courage and strength to carry it out. Amen. Yes, amen and amen. Every problem that the world has could be solved if God's will were done. There is no obstacle, there's no issue, there, there's no contentious situation in the world, on the battlefield, at the kitchen table that cannot be made better by following the will of God. So this morning, and in this very brief series, my prayer is that we will be able to pull back the curtain on God's will, how it can be known, how it can be found by anyone who is willing, listen carefully, to fulfill some basic conditions. You say, wait a second, you mean, you mean God's just not going to, like, give it to me? You know, sometimes, sometimes he does. Sometimes God just kind of poof appears. And the surprised, onlooking crowd is there, wide-eyed, and God reveals his will. Do you know why that makes such good story? It is because it almost never happens. Because God knows something about human nature. If he just pops up and tells us things, very little actual life change takes place. You look at the children of Israel, look at the times when those mir great, these great miracles were taking place. It was also some of the times of greatest apostasy in Israel's history. Because those punctiliar, these, these, these interruptions where God is, poof, here it is. Ah, there's something about how we are wired. It just doesn't tend to stick. So instead of just telling us what his will for us is, God says, come with me on a journey. Take my hand. Fulfill these basic conditions and I will not only reveal my will for you, but you will be transformed on the journey. So with that in mind, how can we know God's will for our lives? The best way that I know of, the number one way that God uses today to give us a knowledge of his will can be found through a story. So when I was about 17 years old, it was summertime. I was in Oklahoma at Oklahoma Conference camp meeting. Uh, it was as it usually is during that time of year. It was quite hot. Uh, I was milling about with my friends uh, on a Friday afternoon. Now, we were out at the entrance to Wawoka Woods, which is the conference campground there, beautiful place, and on the, on the a little highway, the country highway that runs past the entrance there, in those days, there was hardly any traffic. I mean, you could stand on the road and, you know, 10, 15 minutes might go by before somebody else would drive by, just not much traffic. So we're, we're standing there uh, at the road at the entrance, and we are standing around two motorcycles. Uh, one belonged to my friend Jay, and the other one belonged to my friend Wyatt. Uh, Jay had a Yamaha, Yamaha 550, if I remember right, and uh, Wyatt had a Suzuki 750. And Wyatt looks at me and he says, hey, Shane, would you like to take my motorcycle for a ride? Now, freeze frame for just a moment. This is the 1980s. I am dressed for success. I have on deck shoes, no socks. I have short shorts. I have a t-shirt that used to have sides to it, but in those days, we cut the sleeves out, and that's how we wore them, right? <laughs> Furthermore, Oklahoma had no helmet laws in those days. Maybe they still don't. I don't know. But you did have to have safety glasses, and I was pre-equipped. <laughs> I also had extensive motorcycle experience. I had ridden a motorcycle two times <laughs> prior to this. A little Honda 50 and then a Hodaka Pabatko 125 Enduro. Now, I don't know what Hodaka or Pabatko means, but I think it means really slow but runs all day long, okay? <laughs> Very underpowered. I had crashed both motorcycles. <laughs> a little Honda 50, I ran into a tree. Uh, the 125, I ran into my dad's car, okay? So I was feeling pretty confident when Wyatt says to me, hey, Shane, would you like to ride my motorcycle? Uh, I forgot something, too. Uh, Wyatt's motorcycle had been set up for drag racing. Okay. And in a testosterone-laden moment of insight into the proper thing to do at that moment, I said, sure. 
I walked over, I got on the bike, you know, I got the kickstand off, and there I sat there, and I couldn't quite remember what to do next. So I, I said to Wyatt, I said, hey, you know, it's been a little while. Could you kind of refresh me, just going to show me around you a little bit? Yeah, sure. All right. So like, you know, clutch here, it's, you know, one down, five up. And I, okay, got it, got it, got it. So I start the motorcycle, and, and I put the clutch in, and I, and I, and I put it in first. And give it a little gas, let out the clutch, smoothly pull away. And, I mean, you, you, you could, if, those of you that have ridden high-performance motorcycles, you, you, you know very quickly that, that there, there are some horses down there. <laughs> and I thought, okay, let, let's see what it's got. over the hills in Oklahoma out there, and there's rolling hills on that highway. Up through the gears, 85, 90, 95, 100, 105, 110, and about 115 miles an hour, 115, I mean, for the, there was still more left, right? Even though it was geared short. I thought to myself, this seems fast enough. <laughs> I, I have sufficiently mounted the ladder of masculine success. I, I can tell my friends, you know, how fast are you? 150. That, sound, that sounded respectable to me. So I decided my ride was done, and I sat up at 115 miles an hour. And yeah, what you're thinking of happened right away, instantly, just like that, like this, right? I'm hanging on by my fingers, all right? And I had intended to slow down. Well, what's over here? This is the throttle. I am now leaning back, trying to keep myself, and we're going faster, all right? Ah, okay. Right. And I have no clue what to do, right? And, and, and I, I, try, I try to pull myself forward in there, and I, and I suddenly realized, I don't know where the brakes are. Wyatt had not filled me in on the location of that particular control. Now, I'd ridden a lot of bicycles, and I knew that, you know, if you squeezed on the handle up here, I was pretty sure that was the front brake. But even in my deluded state, I realized that was a poor choice at this point to slam on the front brakes, right? So I didn't do that. Well, what to do? Well, I am a passenger as I'm trying to let off the throttle. So my body is kind of twisting like this. And, and what had been a very good motorcycle became a very bad sailboat, okay? So my body's twisted, and it's starting to blow me over to the side of the road. And I'm getting closer and closer and closer to the edge. I can still see the side of that road like it happened yesterday. It is emblazoned in my brain. The, the white line, you know, about that wide, there's about 12 inches of asphalt on the other side of that, and then it dropped off 10 to 20 feet down. It was, it was shale. The roadbed had been built on shale. Now, if you don't know what shale is, shale, is, it, it's relatively brittle. They used to use it for fill quite a bit. And when, it, when they break it up to put it in fill, the edges are quite sharp. You, if you fall, if you just fall down while you're walking on shale, you can cut yourself. And that's what I saw. You know, I, could, I mean, it's just, this is 3D, 4K right here in my mind. And it, go, it went on, as far as I could see at that moment, this is where I was about to go. Now, I would love to tell you that a, a fit of riding prowess came over me. And I shifted my weight like an expert, and I hunkered back down, and I pulled that thing to a stop. That's not what happened. What happened instead is that I got closer and closer to that line. I got right up to the white line, and then I think probably an angel said, oh, man, again, and pushed me back over the other direction. <laughs> Because I, did, I, kind of didn't, I, didn't I didn't know how to do anything at this point. I'm just, I'm just along for the ride, and, and the bike slowly begins to move away from the edge. Blessedly, I came to a hill, and it was long enough that I rolled to a stop, at which point I felt confident in putting the front brake on, so I did. And as my heart rate comes down, I, I, I tippy-toe the bike around facing the other direction, right? Okay. And I very calmly drive back, looking, where is that brake? Where is the brake for the back? And I found it. I found it. I come over the last rise. I come there. I pull up right to where my friends are they're all standing around there. Turn the bike off. Wyatt says to me, so, how was it? <laughs> and I said, it was great. <laughs> That was fantastic. Thanks for letting me ride your bike. Okay. 
I never told Wyatt what happened that day until about 25 years later, I was at Oklahoma camp meeting as a guest speaker, and I told that story. His mother was sitting in the congregation. <laughs> she pulls out her phone and said, what did you do to this young man? You almost got him killed, right? And he calls me and he said, what did you do with my bike? I said, so. <laughs> Be sure that your motorcycle sins will find you out. Okay. Now, I can laugh about this now. We can laugh about this now. In retrospect, that was a pretty serious thing. That, that, that could have ended very, very poorly. And I think to myself, you know, what, what would have helped me in that little story, that little scenario? Well, first off, number one, parents, if you have a child of 17 if it's, uh, that has a motorcycle, Destroy the keys and sell the bike immediately. That's your first step, okay? <laughs> the, 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 the temptation is too strong, okay? So that's, you're, it's too young, right? Secondly, I think what would have helped me, that 17-year-old rider, was one of these. You say, what's that? Well, it's an owner's manual. You say, wait a second, owner's man for a motorcycle, that would have helped you? Yeah, I think it probably would. And you might be thinking, but Pastor Shane, motorcycle owner's manuals aren't designed for, aren't designed for wild-eyed thrill-seekers like you. To which I would say, <laughs> are you kidding? The only reason they make these is because of wild-eyed thrill-seekers like me. Their attorney said, you need to make a book, Okay. And they do. You see, if I had read this book beforehand, I, I might have read things like this. Uh, before riding your motorcycle, take the time to familiarize yourself with its controls. Okay? I, I might have read things like this. Always wear appropriate protective gear when riding your motorcycle. Uh, never ride beyond your skills. Adjust your speed to conditions. And I might have read this as well. Don't ride this motorcycle if you've only ridden a motorcycle twice before and crashed both times. All right, I made that last one up. But, but I mean, that the spirit of that was certainly there. I think the point is clear. If you want to learn how to ride, read the manufacturer's instructions. Do I even need to draw the parallel? <laughs> if you want to learn how to, quote, ride, in this life, or just to put it in terms of our discussion this morning, if you want to learn how to live this life, then read the manufacturer's instructions. This book, the Bible, this is the owner's manual. This is the manufacturer's instructions. The one who made you wrote this. The one who knows how best life works is the one who gave the material for this to be written. It's inspired by his spirit. The manufacturer has not left you to ride on your own. He has instead compiled a very helpful manual if we will only read it. Now, now this is not just my claim. The Bible actually makes some very clear claims about this. And I'd like you to read some things with me here. I'm going to put it on the screen. This is Psalm 119, verse 105. Let's read it together. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, so much of life is dark, is it not? I mean, you, you can often feel like you're walking in a dark hallway with, with no light at the end. God's word is, is a strobe light. It, it's, it's a spotlight that lights up the night. It tells us how life works best. Psalm 119, 111. Let's read this together. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Yeah, at the risk of stating the obvious, sin is the world's top problem. <laughs> Separation from God. That, you know, sin, that's what this sin is. We, we've been separated from God. If we will study the owner's manual, we can find out how to fix that. We can be reunited with God. Psalm 119, verse 89. Let's read this together. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Now, isn't it interesting? He puts it in the heavens. You know, these days, even the best of human laws can be changed. God's word is not that way. And so the psalmist here pictures it as being in heaven, out of the reach of humanity. You can do whatever you want to do, but you cannot change God's word. 
His will stands eternal, something you can count on. How about this? Jesus said this, Matthew 4, verse 4. Let's read this together. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know, most of us eat three meals a day. Some more, but that's another sermon, okay? <laughs> we would not miss those things. And if we miss eating for too long, what happens? Yeah, I mean, just to cut to the chase, we will die. That's how important physical food is to us. Why is it that we make an exception for spiritual food? Jesus here opens, makes the truth very, very clear. Jesus says, just as we eat regular food, this is your food on a table, bread, etc., we need to be eating the owner's manual, the Word of God, the Bible, because this is how we live. Spiritual life cannot exist unless we are spending time in this book. People who don't spend time in this book but claim to be followers of Jesus Christ are dangerous. They are dangerous. Because without the anchor, they're left to every whim that humans are subject to. Let me read something for you here. Famous text, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Paul says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So the word not only makes us generally wise, it certainly does that. It not only teaches us how to be, to be ethical, to be, to be kind, to be just, to be merciful, to be loving, it can actually give us the understanding necessary to know Jesus Christ, to have eternal life. If there's a greater need than that, I don't know about it. This book can make us that kind of a person, someone who is not lost but is saved. It continues, verse 16, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Are you stuck in a rut? Are there good things that you wish you could do, but for some reason it's just not working out? Are there sins that are holding you back? Are there habits that you would love to break but haven't been able to? This book can make you wise unto salvation. God can use this to unlock the secrets to overcoming temptation and becoming the person God has always dreamed you could be. You can be thoroughly equipped, not because I say so, but because God says so. Now, having said all of that, I also know that some of you are a step or two ahead. And some of you may be feeling like, uh, I have a question. Pastor Shane, you've just talked about the Bible and how important it is and the claims that it makes for itself, but aren't there other claims? about other books. They say that those books are also holy books, that they are also of divine origin, that they also ought to be the guide for a person's life. What makes you think, Pastor Shane, that this book somehow is better than those? I think that's an excellent question. Uh, and I think too often Christians kind of brush that off, like, you know, we're, aren't we past that? You know, we're, we're already in this. You know, praise the Lord if you're, if you're, quote, past those things. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are a lot of skeptics in the world. And they have some very good questions. This is one of them. Why should I take the Bible more seriously than any of the host of other supposedly divine books out there? Let me do the best that I can in the short amount of time that I have left to give you some good answers. Actually, let me give you seven good pieces of evidence, good reasons, I think, as to why the Bible is different from the rest. Take a look here. The Bible is different. Reason number one, the manuscript evidence. And the manuscript evidence, you say, what's that about? Well, you know, back in the day uh, when Paul was writing the New Testament, sadly, there were no Apple products available to him. This is one of the great hamperings of, of, the early, of the early world, right? So instead, they would use, you know, stereotypical picture, quill pen, some sort of stylus, right, that they would dip in ink, and they would put it on a manuscript of some sort, papyrus, etc. They would write that down. Here's the thing. We don't have any of the originals for the New Testament, or the old for that matter. 
And some people have said, well, wait a minute, what do you mean? You don't have any of the original documents from the Bible? Well, how do you know then that what it says now is, is what they actually wrote back then? Ah, very good question. And the reason, is that we, the reason why we know that this is still what they wrote is because of the manuscript evidence. Follow me carefully here. Uh, you're familiar with Homer, not Simpson. Okay, this is Homer who wrote the Iliad, among other things. Okay, you maybe studied that in your literature classes, etc. Homer wrote the Iliad in about 800 BC. We have, as usual, no original manuscript from that time, but we do have about 1,800. How many did I say? Okay, we want to make sure we're clear on that. 1,800 full or partial manuscripts, copies of the original. Okay, that are available to us today. About 1,800 of those. This is the most manuscripts by far available for almost any ancient document. I say almost any ancient document. You'll see why. 1,800 there. Most ancient manuscripts, even some titles that you and I would readily recognize, they have less than 20. None of them are originals. They're just copies. We've got fragments or, or full manuscripts there, about 20 copies or so. And get this, the earliest manuscript of Homer's Iliad that we have today, the earliest copy is from 400 BC. That means there's 400 years between when Homer wrote it and the copy, the, 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 early, the late, oldest copy that we have today. 400 years. That's a lot of time. And yet no one doubts today that what we have now in the Iliad is, was what was written by Homer in about 800 BC and that what we have today is essentially what Homer intended for us to read. 1,800 manuscripts. Compare that to just the New Testament. The New Testament, it was written between 50 A.D. or so and about 90, 90 or 92 A.D. That's when Revelation, we think, was written. So about the span of 40 years or so. Again, we have none of the originals. There are no originals in existence today. However, there are more than, get this, 24,000. What number did I say? 24,000. Homer's got 1,800. The New Testament alone has 24,000, and that's a conservative estimate. Depending on how you count, some scholars will double that. 24,000, conservative number, full or partial manuscripts available to us today. The earliest copy that we have is from about A.D. 130, 130. It is only a matter of decades from when the originals were written. And here's the thing. Some people say, well, all those manuscripts, 24,000 plus, ah, who cares? They're all different. They all say different things. You know, there are some differences in the manuscripts. In fact, if you have a Bible like mine, if you look at the apparatus, the footnotes that are down there at the bottom of most pages, it will tell you if there's a variation or something like that. Generally speaking, the variations are minor ones. Sometimes they're just purely grammar. Uh, it has nothing to do with the substance of the text. How much of it agrees, though? How much of the substance is in agreement? Well, it's interesting. How, how do you rate agreement amongst manuscripts? Uh, a few years back, two uh, scholars, Geisler and Nix, decided that they would look at those 24,000 plus manuscripts and they came back that they estimate the level of agreement amongst those manuscripts to be 99.5%. 99.5. Ladies and gentlemen, there is literally no comparison between the New Testament and any other ancient document, period. There is no comparison. This is why when skeptics seek to come at the Bible from a manuscript perspective, they quickly bail out of the endeavor because it just doesn't hold scholarly weight. Too many people have, there's too many manuscripts and they've seen the level of unanimity that is here and the incredible mountain, the number of them, the sheer size of the number of manuscripts. It is breathtaking. The conclusion is inescapable. What we have today was written by the Bible authors who claim to have written them when they claim to have wrote it and says today what they wrote originally. Would you say amen, sister? Because nobody else did, all right? So yes, yes, thank you. I appreciate that. It is a monumental mountain of evidence in favor. What was written then is what we have now. Nothing else even comes close. Second line of evidence, archaeology. I wish I had more time to unpack this one. You know, every year, archaeologists, uh, these are people that are, you know, digging around in the sand in various places and coming up with all kinds of incredible artifacts. Every year, more and more discoveries from Palestine, North Africa, and the Middle East, they continue to be brought to light to validate the stories and events depicted in Scripture. 
You know, anyone who claims that the Bible is nothing more than mythology would benefit from visiting a, a biblical history museum. You know, we have one just within a few hundred yards of right where we're sitting right now. There's the Siegfried H. Horn Museum. And it has artifacts that help to validate that the Bible is true. When I was in Israel back in 2017, I spent 10 days there. And it was a privilege for me to be able to go to the Israel Museum, as well as other archaeological sites. It is astonishing. People who say this stuff is just made up, frankly, they don't know of what they speak. Because the evidence is there, solid. You can see it right standing there in front of you. Number three, eyewitness accounts. You know, the Bible is, is written largely by eyewitnesses, not entirely, but where it is not written by an eyewitness, it is generally written by an author who talked to eyewitnesses. You know, if, uh, let's say that you were speeding through Berrien Springs. I'm sure this would never happen, okay? So this is purely hypothetical. Let's say that you're speeding through Berrien Springs. You get pulled over, you get a ticket. You don't think you should have to pay that much money for simply speeding. And so you go to court and uh, you, the, the judge says, do you have any uh, witnesses to corroborate your side of the case? And you say, well, yes, I do. And you call your friend and the friend goes up there and the judge says, well, tell me, what did you see? And the friend says, well, actually it wasn't there. I, I didn't see anything, but... You see, my, my aunt works at the library uh, just down the road there in Niles, and she heard it from a friend of hers who read something in the paper, and her cousin told my friend who told me, and the judge says, guilty, and you pay twice a fine for contempt of court, all right? Because that kind of testimony doesn't hold any water. But if you bring somebody in, say, who was sitting next to you in the car, and they tell the judge, you know what, judge, I was sitting there and actually uh, they were doing under the speed limit. I looked over when the lights came on and they were doing under, they were doing 44 instead of, you know, 54 in that. Oh, really? Now, I don't know what the judges are like around here, but I can guarantee you they're going to take that kind of witness much more seriously because they were there. They saw it. God's owner's manual for the human race had people that saw firsthand what God was doing. This is not rumor. This is not gossip. This is not the telephone game where by the time you get to the end, you have no semblance of what was started with. These people saw what God did. That's powerful testimony. Number four, straightforward writing style. Very briefly on this. If you've ever read ancient mythology, you know that they can get pretty flowery and ornate and pretty bizarre pretty quickly, extravagant claims of what people did or did not do. There's something called the Apocrypha. It's a group of books that in some small corners of Christianity, they're allowed in the Bible. Most of Christianity does not have them. And the reason for that is because in some of those, for instance, Jesus, as a boy, is, is basically doing parlor tricks for his buds, uh, turning things into animals and whatnot. That's not how things happen. And instead of choosing this kind of superhero extravagant language, the Bible just tells the story. Warts and all. If you notice the stories about the disciples, they're hardly superheroes. <laughs> all of the difficulties and challenges and mistakes, it's all there on display because God wants us simply to know what happened. Straightforward writing style. To me, it's a powerful piece of evidence that the Bible is true. Number five, incredible unity. And we're starting to leave planet Earth here. I don't know if you're noticing this. now. We're getting into the heavenly regions here. This is powerful stuff. Incredible unity. You know, the Bible is actually 66 books, right? I mean, if you look at the table of contents, it's got 66 different sections. 66 books written over a period of 1,500 years. That's a long time. Uh, it's written by more than 40 authors who had occupations that ranged from doctors and kings and statesmen to shepherds and tent makers and fishermen. And yes, there were clergy as well. And yet, despite this impressive diversity of time and place and career, etc., the message of the Bible is incredibly unified. It's almost like it was inspired by an author, capital A, that lived through all 1,500 years of its production. No other so-called holy book comes even close. Because from beginning to end, the Bible tells the story of a Savior. His coming, His arrival, and his soon return. The thread of unity is remarkable. No one can do that. No human being can do that, but God can. Number six, fulfilled prophecy. No document comes even remotely close to the Bible in this category. 
Have you ever gone through the grocery line uh, and, you know, these, uh, the, the, the gossip rags that are there, your National Enquirer, et cetera? Uh, sometimes they, they will feature prophecies. You ever seen that? You know, asteroid will hit Earth in such and such a time, right? Okay, you know, uh, Nostradamus says thus and so. You know, you know if, if, if I got a dollar for every time those predictions in those tabloids were wrong, I would take you all out to choose your restaurant. We, we can all go and, and, and get croissants somewhere, okay? We, we, they are wrong so much, but not the Bible. The Bible bats a thousand. There is not a single unconditional prophecy that the Bible has made that should have been fulfilled by now that has not been fulfilled. Every last one of them has, like clockwork. Yeah, you know, I, let me just give you two examples. Isaiah 44 and 45, it talks about a guy by the name of Cyrus. So that Cyrus is going to come as kind of this messianic type figure is going to save his people. Talked about where this would take place. Even gives some details about uh, gates and whatnot like this. All of this 150 years before it actually happened. 150 years. Names him by name. Daniel chapter 9. 70 weeks prophecy. Goes into this great detail of what the coming, the Messiah, the anointed one, was going to do. You know, the, the, the region that he would do it, the people that he would do it with, confirming this covenant with many, then being cut off, etc. There's an immense amount of detail. The odds of all of those details being fulfilled in one human being are just, they're off the charts. They're astronomical. And yet, 400 years later, it all came to pass just as the prophecy had said. 400 years. I can't tell you what's going to happen four minutes from now. But God can see into the future limitlessly. And he puts it in his word. None of the Bible's prophecies have ever failed, not one. There is no other book that comes even close to that record. And number seven, final piece of evidence, changed lives. You know, if, if there were only the preceding six lines of evidence, that would be impressive enough. But this seventh one to me is the icing on the cake. This is the clincher. Because the fact of the matter is, is that not just a few dozen or a few hundred or a few thousand people, millions of people have had their lives transformed by God working through the words of this book. The, the alcoholic stops drinking. The, the person who, who beats his wife and children stops doing that. The, the, the person who is selfish becomes generous. The, the unfaithful husband becomes a faithful husband. The person who was lost becomes found because of God working through the words of this book. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing like the Bible. There is no other supposedly divine book that even comes remotely close because that's the way God intended it to be. It's His Word. He wrote it down. He gives it to us as His gift. And to me, the conclusion for a reasonable person after seeing this type of evidence and studying things out for themselves, a reasonable person cannot help but conclude this is indeed the Word of God. It can be trusted. You know, it is true that the Bible does not specifically address every single facet in minute detail of our lives. If you're looking for the right person to marry, you probably will not open the pages and say, uh, please ask Nellie out on a date. Okay, it's probably not going to say that, right? Uh, and two weeks from now, in part two of this series, we are going to explore in depth how to find God's will in those kinds of situations where, where the specifics are not directly addressed. How do you still find out God's will for those situations? We're going to talk about that. Come back in two weeks and we'll look at that in part two. But suffice it for now to say that the Bible does give principles for dealing quite literally with every situation facing humanity on the planet today. No exceptions. There are principles there for everything, uh, economic uncertainty, issues of sexuality, war and oppression, health issues, politics, racism, and whatever difficulties a person may have in their life, the Bible has principles that address them. God has not left himself without a witness on this planet. And I hope, I hope, I hope that by now, some of you are saying something like this. Okay, okay, Pastor Shane, I get it, I get it. Bible's a good book. I, 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 I need to get into it here. 
How, Pastor Shane, can I do it? How do I find the answers that I'm looking for in the Bible? What, what technique can I use? How do I do it? This is an excellent question. And after nearly 30 years of doing ministry with people of, with, with varying desires to get into the book, I have the absolute best answer to that question. How do I find the answers that I'm looking for in the Bible? The answer is... Read it. Read the book. You say, well, 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 wait a second, what do you mean? Well, okay, let me put a finer point on it. Read it at least as much as you consume other media. They say, well, preacher, you've gone from preaching to meddling now. I'm not sure about that. All right, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, biblical illiteracy is a huge problem in the church today. It's a, it's, it's a real problem. We have gotten so used to getting our information through 30-second uh, sound bites or impossibly compressed news stories. We've gotten so used to this that the idea of actually sitting down on a regular basis with an actual book and studying it no longer appeals to us. We are like wild-eyed, thrill-seeking motorcyclists hurtling down the highway with little to no knowledge of what God would actually have us do, not realizing just how close to spiritual disaster we actually are. So I plead with you, read the manufacturer's instructions. You know, there's entire classes and books that you can read about, you know, for techniques about how to, how to study the Bible. And please read those things. By all means, take those classes. They're very valuable. We need those things. And, and, the Bible is written in such a way that there are portions of it a child can understand. There is something in here for everybody. It's a big book. Read it. Be brutal with your schedule. Make time. God is longing to speak with you. He longs for the transformation that he sees, but maybe you're not yet there. He longs for you to read the, read the owner's manual. Read this book. The greatest story ever told lies within its pages, and the greatest life you could ever live is found there as well. I'm Shane Anderson, the lead pastor here at Pioneer Memorial Church. At Pioneer Media, we have been blessed by the financial support that comes from our viewers like you that enable us to continue this ministry. We've made a conscious decision not to continually appeal to you for that support. However, keeping this ministry going takes money to support our staff and technology needs. If God has blessed you and you would like to further the work of this ministry, we invite you to partner with us. You can donate on our website, pmchurch.org, then click Giving at the top then select Media Ministry. Or call the number 877-HIS-WILL. Again, that number is 877, the two words, His Will. My prayer is that the God who has blessed you will continue to pour into your life the gifts of His joy and His hope. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you right here again next time.